Hello, I'm Jan Oberg of the Transnational Foundation for Peace and Future Research in Lund, Sweden. And uh, today I will be speaking um, about 30 minutes, perhaps a little more, we'll see, about nuclear weapons, but probably not in the way you expect, uh, because I'm not going to focus on the weapons themselves, but on nuclearism the ways people think and make them legitimate, these weapons, and the way human beings kind of live with this existential threat without thinking too much about it. But first of all, of course, a little bit of the weapons themselves and why they're absolutely special. First of all, they came into the world in 1945 with the first test in the Alamo Gold or, or, or Desert in uh, New Mexico in the US. And they were then used, as everybody knows, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in uh, August <clears throat> 1945. And have not been used directly physically since then, but have had other effects on the international community that I shall uh, get into very soon. We have them uh, in a number of countries, the United States, France, Britain, Israel, <clears throat> India, Pakistan, China. And you should know by point of departure that these weapons were by January this year, 2021, uh, declared illegal or in contravention of international law because since then there is a treaty for the abolition of nuclear weapons or the prohibition of them. I shall come back to that. What I'm talking about the next half an hour is something which the world uh, can justifiably say is criminal activity. Where do we find them? We find them on submarines. We find them in silos on land and we find them on the, the wings of uh, aircraft. Meaning most of them are moving around all the time. Of course, some are stationed in stores, but they're moving around all the time. Particularly deep down in the oceans, where the nuclear powers are kind of looking at each other and have developed weapons for anti-submarine warfare. Um, and we have an alliance called NATO in which nuclear weapons is an integral part. It doesn't, they are not, that particular weapon system is not mentioned in the treaty of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty uh, of 1949. Uh, but NATO is a special organization also because it is based on the right to be the first to use nuclear weapons, also against a conventional attack from someone, let's say Russia uh, or China, whatever, you know, in this imagined world of people who construct uh, irrelevant threats. Uh, and even if it's a cyber attack, NATO countries, particularly the United States, which has a particular doctrine for this, reserves the right to use nuclear weapons against a non-nuclear attack. So that's a little bit rundown of it. We have fewer of them today than we had before. Um, we got rid of them in the peace movement years of um, the, the uh, European Pershing II and cruise missiles. Uh, which was a victory in the 80s that led to or was part of the dissolution of the Cold War in Europe. Where do we now have a new Cold War? Apart from the countries that own these, these weapons, we also have them stationed in a number of European countries. Uh, if I remember correctly, on top of my head, uh, Italy, Turkey, uh, Germany and um, Holland or Belgium. That can be looked up, for instance, in the CIPRI, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute's yearbooks. There are lots of details, but I'm not going into these details, the technical 
stationing uh, infrastructure of nuclear weapons. I shall therefore move to my second point, which is the existential dimension of these weapons, because they are absolutely in a category of their own. After that, I shall talk about the deterrence philosophy of which they are part. And finally, I shall come to the question of what can we do about it, if anything. And I believe we can, but I believe that the resistance against nuclear weapons so far has been rather ineffective, ineffective and that we need to do something else. First of all, these weapons are special because they are omnicidal. That means if used, they will destroy everything. It doesn't mean they'll destroy everything we know on Earth, but it will, if used, they would destroy life conditions, living conditions, and they would kill millions of people, even if as small as the Hiroshima bomb. The Hiroshima bomb, uh, the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki were small bombs compared with those that exist today. So omniscient, not genocide on people, but omniscient, that is destruction of everything, is a characteristic of these weapons. And then you may say, if everybody has been kind of against these weapons, and I don't know anybody who would like to use them, or be killed by them, or be protected or defended by means of using nuclear weapons, what is it they do? Do they have a positive function? I've come to believe that they probably have. First of all, we've been told that we cannot live without nuclear weapons. It's uh, the ultimate protection of our society and culture and civilization. This course is nonsense. But, you know, if sufficiently many uniformed people say so over decades, some people may believe it. But they do something else. They help us with our individual death. Now, well, the only thing we know for sure is that one day each of us will die. That's, a, of course, a painful thought. How will I die? Who will be with me when it happens? How can I leave uh, my friends and lo loved ones and family behind? And if I'm seeing them go, it's a terrible thing in my life. Nuclear weapons promise you a smart thing. Uh, Tom Lira, the American pianist, entertainer and political black humor expert from Harvard University, where he was a mathematician professor, in the 60s had a text which was, we will all go when we go. Every Hottentot and every Eskimo. And he sang that, you know, with great fun and laughter, as satire should be, because these things are so horrible that you have to have a satirical, humoristic uh, attitude to them. It saw, these weapons solve, in a way, the problem we had with individual death. Because if we are used, we will all go together when we go, all the loved ones will go with me somewhere else, wherever that is, whatever we believe. Secondly, the existential dimension is that they permit some people, politicians and military, to play God. Because what nuclear weapons can do is what only God could do before. Namely, decide about the future of humanity's existence. Should humanity exist or should humanity be punished and disappear? The whole, you know, civilization of human beings... Is it worth it? Should it go? So from July 1945, human beings have taken over the role of God as the permissive or punishing highest authority. If somebody in America or China or Russia or whatever, I think I forgot to mention Russia as a nuclear power, but of course a nuclear weapons power, but of course it is, um, in the list I made over uh, nuclear haves, as they are called. 
if they are used, the person who would press the button, push the button, would see him or herself as a godlike figure. I have the right to decide about the whole existence of seven plus billion people's lives, future, non-existence and death. Only God could do that before July 1945. If we believe in God, whatever. But you get my image of it. They are also very interesting because they are invisible. I have never seen a nuclear weapons uh, a weapon. I've seen pictures of it. I've seen the bomb that was used at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, Fat Man, as it was called. But I have not physically seen it. It is like God, invisible. The difference is we can discuss whether God exists or not. We cannot discuss whether nuclear weapons exist or not. They do exist. But they exist in secret communities, in bases and places where none of us can go and touch them and get a sense of them. In that sense, they are enigmatic, but a total destroyer, if used of all our lives. They represent a technological victory, but also a moral defeat. And this eternal balance between what we can do technically on this earth and what we should abstain from doing, even though we can do it, is something that humanity has never solved. We have this, oh, if we can do it, we should try to do it. Which, of course, was what the Americans did in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There is also the idea that the world has gone into such deep crisis. And there are evil people all over. Big or small. But there's somebody who's out to get us. And therefore, if we could use them with some kind of, let's say, selectivity, we might be able to survive. Of course, the person who would press the button has the belief that he and his kin, family, country, society, or culture will survive, whereas the others will go. That's an illusion, but uh, it, it, the whole thing is built on illusions. But then the argument would be, if we used them sparingly, could we purify and start all over again with a new and more clean world, a world, a globe where evil has been bombed away and the good ones can continue? And finally, there's a huge issue of denial. Until you listen to this lecture here, how much did you think of nuclear weapons? How much did it occur to you that you could be dead tomorrow? I remember many years ago I was standing in Austria teaching some of my dear students and I said half jokingly after a lecture about nuclear weapons, now we're having a lunch break, see you after lunch if we are still here. And you know, you keep, you keep these terrible things on a distance by joking a little bit about it. I went up to my room, searched my computer for news, and there I see that a British and a French nuclear submarine have collided in the Atlantic with such heavy physical damage that the British one had to be towed into harbour. It could not uh, sail in there itself. We still are without any knowledge about what happened, but there were two NATO submarines colliding, running into each other, both of them equipped with nuclear weapons. Now, they are well protected, and the risk that an explosion should happen is small. But again, how many times do these things happen without us being told? Because all the countries, all the nuclear authorities, military presidents, do not want us to know. So we're talking about a weapon system, a type of weapon which is completely different from anything else for the reasons I mentioned. And they have also 
if you look into deep psychology, perhaps some positive effects, because otherwise, explain to me why these completely mad weapons with completely immoral elements, particularly if used, are still with us. Why they have not been scrapped, abolished as lacking or not fitting human civilization, as we have done with slavery, as we have done with uh, the moral repulsion of rape, as we've done with cannibalism, as we've done with absolute monarchy and dictatorship, as we've done with genocide. There are certain things in human history where it's like, because we have civilization, because we have developed over thousands of years, there are things we don't do and things we don't want to have. But we still accept nuclear weapons. So my turning the whole thing upside down is there must ups obviously in people's perception of the world be something positive about nuclear weapons. Because if they were only seen as bad stuff, they would probably have been abolished long ago. So I've now, talk, now talked about nuclear weapons as a physical object, and I've talked a little bit about the existential dimension, of course, just scratching the surface of these very, very interesting cultural, psychological dynamics. And denial is probably the most important. They are so awful. They are so frightening. Their consequences are so unbelievable and unimaginable that most of us prefer to not even think of the fact that we could be gone this afternoon or tomorrow because a media has pressed the button or because of a technical failure. So I now move to the third part, and that has to do with <coughs> deterrence. Deterrence theory. The idea is, and that's what you hear people say who defend the existence of nuclear weapons, we have nuclear weapons in order to deter the other side from starting a war on us because we have what is called a second strike capability. If one attacks us, somebody attacks us with nuclear weapons, we have as enough nuclear weapons on our submarines or in our silos or under the wings of our planes, which are in the air all the time, that they will not have been able to hit, even though target them. So we can retaliate with a second retaliatory strike. So there's a first strike and a second strike. And the argument is, therefore, we have not had a nuclear war because all parties know that you will be hit yourself, that if you kill the other side over there with nuclear weapons, maybe 100 million people or whatever, then they will also kill, or be able to kill, uh, answer back and kill us. That's what deterrence is about. Now, that theory is a very bad theory. Because it, it, it argues that nuclear weapons are there to never be used, but only to prevent war. Now, think it through. If two parties knew about each other, that the other would never use nuclear weapons back on me in a second strike, would there be any deterrence? The answer is no. The parties who believe in deterrence, in this, you know, I kill you if you kill me, obviously build on the assumption that I am willing to use nuclear weapons, press the button if attacked. That means that every nuclear weapon on Earth is there to be used if the situation occurs in which somehow a nuclear weapon or a number of them goes off and hits another territory for technical failure reason, human failure, or as a deliberate political action. 
Therefore, it is not true when you hear military and politicians and people who, other people who never read a book about these things, that it's such a peaceful weapon and it has created peace on us because it prevents people from using uh, them. It exists to be not used. But if, I repeat, A and B know about each other, that the other side would never use nuclear weapons in a second strike back. It is without cost for me to throw the first and see no retaliation on myself. Therefore, those countries which have nuclear weapons must obviously be willing to use them. Maybe not as a first, but definitely back as a second strike. Now, what is characteristic of nuclear weapons as different from all other weapons is, well, not all other, but most other weapons, is that they adhere to, are built well, based on a philosophy of terrorism. What distinguishes war from terrorism is that terrorism deliberately targets civilians. Whereas war is normally a clash between people in uniforms and military arms and stuff like that. Terrorism is to, let's say, kill children on a school bus to achieve a political goal. That's exactly what nuclear weapons do. You cannot use nuclear weapons without killing millions, even though the smallest with them would today kill millions of people or make life uninhabitable in areas, in regions, so that people would die slowly from not having it or living in a radioactive uh, desert. So when we talk about ISIS or Al-Qaeda or the Taliban or whatever, which is fashionable at the moment, they are peanuts compared to the nuclear powers. There are no greater terrorism on Earth and no greater terrorists on Earth than those nuclear power leaders who adhere to the philosophy of nuclear terrorism. It used to be called the balance of terror. This deterrence I just mentioned used to be called the balance of terror. But after 9-11, 2001, the word, the concept of terror has been limited to only small groups like ISIS who attack some people, not, or civilian groups, or fractions in different countries, but no, no longer for what states and governments do. So there's state terrorism, which category includes, a category which includes nuclear terrorism, the terrorism of using nuclear weapons, and there is private or small group terrorism, such as ISIS, um, Al-Qaeda, etc. But we talk a lot about the small terrorism, which at the moment hits about 16,000 people who are killed in, annually in small terrorism. We never talk about our governments. The fact that a lot of you listening to this may be members of country, live, citizens of countries that are members of NATO, it doesn't occur to you that you're part of a political system that builds on terrorism fundamentally terrorism, achieving a political goal by means of killing, harming, maiming, or whatever individual innocent civilians who are not party to the conflict, but victims of it. These are very essential things to say about nuclear weapons, and they are worth a study and a concentration among students and young people today, because you are going to live in this world that, unfortunately, people in the my parents' generation developed and never were able to control and de-develop and get rid of again. There's been tons of disarmament negotiations about nuclear weapons. There's so-called nuclear proliferation treaty that should prevent other countries from getting nuclear weapons, provided those who had nuclear weapons would abstain from using them and would disarm them and get rid of them. All this has been a fraud. We have no substantial uh, disarmament of nuclearism. We have countries that now develop new technologies, more sophisticated nuclear weapons, etc., in total contravention of international law and the UN Charter. 
Nuclear weapons, secondly, in this third part, are politically unacceptable. There exists no political goal you might like to achieve that can justify the use of killing of millions of people and making large areas of the world uninhabitable, impossible to live in. There is no such goal. I mean, if you work for democracy or you work for uh, against an aggressor who is coming to your country or something like that, they, this cannot legitimate the use of weapons that could kill millions of people. They are morally unacceptable because no country, no human being, no system has a right to decide the future of humanity. It's immoral. Anyone who believes in nuclear weapons is an immoral person in the sense that he or she obviously believes that he or she has a higher right than anybody else, namely to play God, as I said before. Who has the right to decide the future of 7 billion people plus? No one. That, that self-belief of your own importance or your own superiority or your contempt for weakness, your contempt for those who have less weaponry, borders of Nazism, fascism, or whatever you'd like to call it. It's an outrageously clear example of racism. Because you cannot use nuclear weapons on somebody you respect. You can only do it on somebody you look down upon in a racist. They do, don't deserve to survive. They're militarily useless. If you've used nuclear weapons, you cannot use that territory on which they fell. It's very simple as that. They're militarily useless. They are incompatible with democracy because no country that has nuclear weapons has ever given its people a right to a referendum. Do you want to be protected by or have security through the existence of or use of nuclear weapons? That question has never been asked to anybody in the nuclear countries. They have just woken up one morning to the fed complete that my country is now a country that has nuclear weapons. And there's not one nuclear power today, nuclear weapons power, I should say, who would dare to have a referendum and ask its people, shall we scrap or shall we keep nuclear weapons? Because it's all the opinion polls that have been made show clearly a majority, a huge majority, majority in all countries against the existence of nuclear weapons. There are a few things that are so clear in the world indicating the deep conflict between governments or leaders and citizens. Citizens nowhere, basically, of course, there might be 5% or 3% or something somewhere, but there's a huge majority who say no to nuclear weapons. And they're the ones who have finally been listened to in the treaty I mentioned from January 2021. But governments don't listen another indicator of the utter lack of democracy and listening to people's will. So, um, finally, they are dangerous in peacetime. You may think that we only talk about nuclear weapons would be terrible if there was a war and they were used. No. There's been huge wars such as against Iraq because nuclear weapons have been used as a pretext. The West, the US, said that Saddam Hussein had nuclear weapons and therefore it smashed up Iraq. There have been lots of accidents with nuclear weapons. They've even been lost from planes. Allegedly, three nuclear devices, weapons, bombs, were, were lost under the wings of an American airplane, I think in the 50s somewhere, over Greenland. One of them are still there and never recovered. There are evidence and investigations, and they're publicly available for the one who searches on the net, that people have been drunk in command centers where nuclear buttons existed. Presidents have been intoxicated by, you know, either victory mentality or alcohol and discuss the nuking, the nuke, uh, using nukes 
on other people's. Daniel Ellsberg has revealed, because he sat in Pentagon at the time, that there was a huge pressure on the American president to use nuclear weapons on China back in the, um, forgetting whether it was the 60s. We have been this close to a nuclear exchange, nuclear catastrophe, lots of times. People using drugs. These weapons are too dangerous in the hands of all people. But the racism is that we in the Christian Western world, predominantly, with the exception of Pakistan, uh, Israel and uh, China, we, we have the moral, um, you know, legitimacy to have these weapons because we are more responsible than Muslims in Iran or something like that. Yeah, racism is a very important part of Western politics and self-perception. So, I've given you the three points. What is the, the nature of the weapons physically and politically? What is the existential aspects of it? And what are these semi-psychopolitical dimensions such as deterrence, democracy, and all these relations to nuclear weapons. And the last thing I'm going to say is what can we do about it? Well, you and I can only be surprised that there is not an uproar against this most immoral of all weapons ever invented. But there is no uproar. There's denial on the one hand, and there's secrecy among those who run this system, which is, of course, again, the military, industrial, media, academic, complex, MIMAC. And then third, I think there's no uproar because those who've been fighting against and building opinion against nuclear weapons have made a few mistakes. They have shown too many Hiroshima films and interviewed too many of the Hibaksha, Actually, it's a Japanese word for the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Of course, I'm not sitting here and sounding arrogantly. We shouldn't listen to the victims and we shouldn't see the pictures from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But, you know, if you do that decade after decade, film after film, lecture after lecture, exhibition after exhibition, you end up in what the American psychiatrist Robert J. Lifton calls psychic numbing. It doesn't make an impression anymore. And it is seen as something which is history. Hiroshima as a museum. Not something that is related to today and tomorrow and our lives and whether or not we will be here tomorrow. The more we talk about Hiroshima, the more the whole nuclear discussion is distant from today, where they are there, where they're threatening or so on, by their sheer existence, even when not being used. And the more people talk about them and say, oh, it must never happen, they will destroy the whole world when, if used, which I have done also, to give you a sense of it, we increase people's fears. And when people fear, there's a political concept for it, and that is fearology. When people fear, they don't act. So I would say instead, go the other way around. Look at all the countries that don't have nuclear weapons. Lots of countries around the world have been fiddling with the idea, had research projects and decided not to develop nuclear weapons. They are the civilized countries of this world. We should... We should uh, celebrate them instead of only focus our attention on the very few out of humanity, 193 countries who are still criminals and terrorists in their philosophy. Sweden was very close to get nuclear weapons in the 50s, decided not to. Yugoslavia was very close, decided not to. Austria has a pre it is, I don't remember whether it's in the constitution or it's a political decision to never acquire. South Africa has done the same. Kazakhstan has done the same. Kazakhstan was the place where most 
of Russia's military um, nuclear weapons were tested. And there are huge areas, as far as I've been informed when I was in Kazakhstan, huge areas you cannot enter because they are, they are, uh, they, they were test sites. Kazakhstan and its uh, president at the time, Nazarbayev, decided to get rid of all nuclear weapons that were standing in Kazakhstan. So let's make a, make a positive list of all the countries that have decided not to go down this um, uh, uncivilized road, but could technically have done it. We could have had many more nuclear uh, powers today than we have. Also, if you have been told for decades by experts and people in uniform and media that nuclear weapons are non-problematic and they are preserving your security and they are creating peace and look, they have not been used since 45. Then, of course, you will say, oh, my God, how can we do without them? And therefore, the answer is we should build a military and a civilian defense policy and security policy and peace policy see, and conflict resolution policy in which they are not felt as needed weapons. We should make nuclear weapons superfluous. And then we will look back and say, how on earth could we be so stupid, so unethical, so recklessly individualistic that we thought that nuclear weapons was a good idea. Nuclear weapons must become a parenthesis in humanity's history. It's as simple as that. The world would be a much better place without nuclear weapons. Look at the vision. Persuade people through visions of a better nuclear-free world where zone after zone, continent after continent, country after country, city after city is declared politically a nuclear weapons-free zone. Anybody can do that if they want to, because then normatively we make people discuss these things. We say we don't want these weapons anymore. They don't belong to civilization. There's so much we could do constructively and that would isolate completely the remainder few who have nuclear weapons. They would become pariahs and the most intelligent of them would start nuclear abolition. Small steps down, small steps down, inviting other nuclear powers to do the same in a safe way. So alternative defense thinking a new peace policy would automatically have much more of a chance against nuclear weapons than just focusing on nuclear weapons and saying no, no, no. Say yes to something if you work for peace and want to see a better world. So I think this is what I can manage to say. As much more as you can hear, I've just scratched the surface of these four points. But I really hope that what I've said will be something you will not deny, put away, believe as just somebody Jan is saying. This is the existential threat number one. And you may say then, well, the probability that nuclear weapons are used is obviously small because it has not happened since 1945. You may be right. But the day you are wrong, we are all gone. And nobody has a right to decide such a moment. And therefore, denial is the worst you can do. Engage in these issues, participate in all the anti-nuclear groups, change the way peace work is done. And of course, nuclear weapons will go one day, as did cannibalism, slavery, rape, child labor, absolute monarchy and all the other things because they don't belong to civilization. Thank you very much.